morning. Good, mor good morning, everybody. Um, welcome to this uh, Proust breakfast session. Thank you for showing up. Um, Andre and I have a very loose um, agenda. Um, we are going to talk about Proust together, but I think most of the talk, most of the today's talk, will be Andre doing a presentation of a particular passage, which I think you will have. Yes, there's a there's a printout for everybody here. Um, briefly, our qualifications for talking about Proust are. I'm a publisher, but a Proust lover, and I worked on Proust, a translation of Proust into English for um, several years. And that was my way of getting to know it. And Andre? Uh, I'm, I'm a writer and an academic, and occasionally I teach a course on Proust. But we both love Proust. We both love Proust. And I, I thought it might be a good start just to sort of begin this conversation with each of us talking a little bit about how we first encountered Proust in our lives and what it meant to us. Um, so Andre, why don't you begin? OK, my, I, it starts with my father. So it is fundamentally Oedipal. Um, my father loved Proust, and he always spoke about Proust. And at some point when I was 14, he said, um, you're really not ready to read Proust yet, but why don't you give it a try? I mean, the, the problem was that it was also in French, and my French wasn't so sort of so handy, let's say. And, um, but I did start. He said, why don't you start with the second volume? It might interest you more, because it's about an adolescent. And I was 14, so I started reading it. And I figured, this is uncannily easy. And, and so I began to read it. And, um, but then I put it down, because the words of my father in the back of my mind told me that this is not as easy as Dostoevsky. So I put it off. And then a few years later, I began to read it, and I couldn't put it down. And ever since then, I've been rereading it and rereading it and, uh, and forgetting everything except for the first time that I read it. OK, it always works this way. So memory is sort of germane to the subject. And I, I, um, read, I, read, I read French at university. In, in England, and it's a four-year course, and the third year of the course, uh, students are sent away to France or whatever language they're studying to teach in our high school. And I applied to teach in Paris, thinking I'd have a very glamorous year, and I was sent to Marseille, um, which is a wholly different experience, to teach at a, a technical high school, which is a, a high school for any people who want to become engineers, in a very far-off suburb of Marseille. And I spent, um, I arrived and I was given an apartment and uh, nobody spoke to me. And I was actually intensely lonely for the first few months. And during that period, I, I read Proust. And I, I had the rare experience of reading Proust from the beginning to the end, almost continuously for a series of weeks and months. And so it was this complete immersion and it was this a way of escaping a world where I felt uncomfortable and not sure of myself into a world that was quite densely populated and where I felt very comfortable indeed. Um, and then I went back to Oxford and I wrote uh, a paper on Proust, <coughs> uh, a short paper about the role of music, the role that music plays in the uh, entire novel, which is very key. Andre knows a lot about that. Um, and then finally, oddly, late, later in my life, in my professional life as a publisher, I, I was working at a small literary publishing house called Chateau and Windus, which wa was and is the original publisher of the English translation of Proust by Scott Moncrief. And we decided to embark on a revision of that translation. And I was the editor and the publisher working on that revision. So I had to go deeply into the text in English in, in translation. So I sort of learned about it again through the English version. And I've stayed close to it ever since. And I continue to read it to this day. Well, I, I think that what it does is it, it's one of the few books that actually changes who you are or how you think or how you approach reading, just the act of reading. And one of the things that happens to me is that every time I look at a new book, which I do, I always open new books at Barnes & Nobles, I look at the first page, and the first thing that comes to mind is this is nothing like Proust. Now, this is really unfair. You shouldn't do that to anyone, particularly if it's a book by a friend of yours, OK? But it's the first thing that comes up. So you say, nobody can actually measure up to the degree of excellence that Proust um, sort of encompasses and always projects with such ease 
which uh, it, the, the, the stunning thing is that it didn't take him forever to write a page. It, he was very quick. So imagine writing these things so quick, the way people write emails. I mean, just really very fast, and making a few corrections, a few cuts there. Usually cuts, not additions. Um, and, and so you, you're dealing there with the, the simple word is genius. Uh, now, some people cannot stand Proust because it requires a particular kind of labor. I teach it occasionally at a high school because I teach it to graduate students who are writing their dissertations on Proust. And I also teach it in a high school. And high school students are amazing because they, they digest it, they get it right away, it's easy. Um, so that's one of the things that I always say to people, as if I'm trying to sell you Proust. If you're in this room, you might be already a sold client, but um, most people find it very difficult. Uh, or at least it's not your run-of-the-mill magazine writer. I think, and I think one of the, well, one of the things I've learned reading Proust um, as an exercise over the years is that you don't need to keep reading the whole thing from the beginning to the end. It's completely permissible and actually enjoyable to dip right in, to start at one of the one of the novels in the middle of the series and read it for itself. Yeah. You can do that and it can be a wholly rewarding experience. So people who are intimidated by the epic scale of the work really shouldn't be. They can they can step in and they can step out again. I agree. I totally agree. Yeah. Um, so but, Andre, do you want to talk yeah, about I'll, this? I'll say a few things because I'm interested in a particular aspect of Proust. And um, it has come to me rather circuitously. So I'm going to try to speak about the kind of mind game that Proust plays with the reader, with his characters, and with himself as an author. And I, I, it came to me a couple of weeks ago when I thought about a college professor once taught Machiavelli to me. And he said, there's one thing you have to remember about Machiavelli. It's all about acquisition, how to acquire power, how to acquire land, how to acquire loyalty from people, and ultimately how to keep what you've acquired. If you think about it, it's a reductionist notion, but it, what it does is that it allows you to build from that reduction. And for me, the idea about Proust is very reduced. Um, the idea is to come to a point of arrival after that, is the notion of possession. Proust is about possession. Um, and if you think about it, the first, the opening scene, forget memory, we're not going to discuss memory. Um, the opening scene is about a little boy who wants his mommy to come and say goodnight to him. And she's with friends downstairs, they're having a dinner, a particular gentleman happens to be there whom he dislikes because every time he's, the guest is there, Monsieur Swan, what happens is that the little Marcel does not get his goodnight kiss. Now, what the goodnight kiss means, I want the kiss, and I want the kiss to last for a long time. I want to possess, I want to own that kiss. His mother says, well, goodnight now, here's the kiss. She's at the dinner table, and he has to walk up the stairs by himself, holding the kiss on his cheek as if he wants to own it. He wants to own his mother. This is not the right goodnight sleep. Um, good night kiss that he is aiming for. So he doesn't, can't fall asleep, and he's nervous, and he gets agitated, and eventually he hears his mother coming upstairs. She's going to bed, and he sees her, and he, he's caught. And worse yet, he's caught by his father. And the mother says, the boy is agitated. What should we do? He says, oh, just go and sleep with him. That's the end of it. So the little Marcel finally not only gets his goodnight kiss, he gets his whole mother, the whole package is given. He gets to own her for that one night. Problem is, he's upset now. He, he feels that something is wrong. He feels remorseful. He feels guilty that he's forced his mother to do something that she's not happy to do. And now it's basically the, getting the kiss ruins the kiss. So you have this act of what I call dispossession. Suddenly, the very man who wanted this thing takes it away from himself. You will see this happening throughout the novel. There is no such thing as love in Proust. He calls it love, but it's not love. It's just a feverish desire to get someone. To, he wants someone, and he needs to get them. He doesn't know what love is. I don't think he believes in it. He, he doesn't know what to do with it once he gets it, if he gets it. So he, all he wants is to possess the woman, and that you see in the, in the act of Swan himself, who's the same exact way as little Marcel. Um, so they, they find themselves in situations where they actually don't even like the person that they allege to love. 
And there's a very famous sentence at the very end of Swan in Love when he says, you know, to say that I've spent all these years, all this time loving a woman who wasn't even my type. You know, and then he'll say something like, you know, she cheats on me, I know, but she's so stupid. Okay, so uh, in, in a sense, he's totally aware of the fact not only that she's cheating on him, but that she's also, that he's also colluding and making it possible for her to cheat on him. Because though he wants to catch her, he misses every single time. And when he has the opportunity to do that, he just bunkles it. Um, so you have a sense that this man doesn't really want to possess the woman. He likes the idea of it. The one time, I think, that where he actually, where Marcel actually has someone he loves, and please don't laugh, it's his, not even his mother, it's his grandmother, okay? And the most touching scene of absolute intimacy between two individuals is when they're in a hotel, and they're at the beach, and little Marcel, of course, is always very agitated. He's alone in his room, he feels alone, and there's, his grandmother is in the next room. She says, look, if you are nervous, something's not right, just knock three times on the wall and I'll hear you. And she says, by the way, tomorrow morning when you wake up, knock when you wake up, and I will make sure that they get you warm milk. The kid is an adolescent. He's not a child anymore, okay? Um, and, of course, he wakes up, and he doesn't know whether she's awake. And he doesn't want to knock too early because she might wake up. And at the same time, he's kind of getting nervous. And she says to him, you little fool, don't you think that I know exactly what you were feeling? I could hear the sheets rustling in your room. OK, I knew you were nervous. Uh, you're my little, mon petit loup, uh, my little mouse, my little wolf, whatever. So this is the, but here's again, this is the only moment that we have of absolute sort of cohesion between two human beings who love each other. There's a partition wall between them. It's not incidental. Marcel begins to have sense, a sense that his grandmother might not live too long. And so one day he gets a call from her, and they can't communicate because he can't hear her very well. And he begins to make all kinds of allusions to the reader that she's already in the nether space somewhere underground, and she's trying to reach him. And that's how he hears her voice. Trouble is that Marcel Proust wrote the passage many, many times, among them to his mother. And then you begin to understand there's something weird here. What he's really doing, what Marcel Proust and Marcel are doing, is they are rehearsing the actual death that will come. And this is typical Proust. You rehearse the end or the painful moment. You, re you repeat it to yourself so that in the end it won't hurt you so much. There's a fear of actual pain. And what happens then is that as he rehearses her death to himself, at some point, she does die. And the whole thing is like a comic scene. I mean, it's so, it's beautifully written, but very chilly, very coldly written, to the point where Marcel will say to himself, you know, she's dead, it's not so bad, I've been let off easily. Okay, and, and then you have that wonderful moment a year later, he goes to the same hotel and he's about to buckle his shoes, uh, tie his laces actually, and this is something that she used to do for him because he was unable to bend, and as he bends down, he bursts out crying. She's never, ever, ever going to be back with me again. I'm never, ever going to see her again. He's terrible, he turns to the wall, and of course the wall that he used to knock three times at, just sends the message even more forcefully to him. So you have two moments here that are very important in Proust. One is the, what I call ritual is the repetition of something that has already occurred in your life. You keep repeating it. And the other one is what I call rehearsal, is you repeat what is about to occur. The problem is, as anybody will notice, is that there's no such thing as the present. The present does not exist for Proust. He cannot deal with the present. There's always the anticipation of something happening or the recollection of something that has happened. In fact, the most telling acts of remembrance, and I promise not to speak about memory, but here we are. The most telling moments of memory are when he remembers rehearsing 
something that's going to happen in the future. He is never, ever in the present. And so one of the things I wanted to, to touch base on is to look at this passage. If I may, I'm going to get another one. This is a scene, and then I'll shut up. <laughs> this is for you. This is a scene when Marcel, uh, where Swan has just, who's kind of falling in love with Odette, who is, let's face it, she's a hooker, okay? Um, he's had sex already in the afternoon in his carriage. So he feels like, I can arrive late to meet Odette. She won't mind, you know, it's a big deal. And he arrives late, so late in fact, that she's already gone from the evening where they were supposed to meet. So now he's in a fever. I need to meet that woman again. Blah, 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 blah. Finally, of course, when you're looking for someone in a 19th century stupid novel, you meet them. Okay? And, and Proust is fully aware of doing something that's so typically 19th century. He's aware of how ridiculous it is. And so one of the things he does is he, Swan finds her. They get in the carriage together. He picks her up and he's going to take her home. And so as they're standing together, she's wearing these uh, orchids. And so as the carriage moves, some of the pollen falls on her chest. Bad symbolism, really tacky, OK? Um, but of course, he's a late 19th century writer, early 20th century writer, who's absolutely, by the way, Proust is a shameless writer, if you know how to read him. Um, so she's got the pond and he tries to clean it and uh, rubs it off and says, I'm not hurting you, I'm not bothering you. And anyway, at some point, he slipped his other hand upward along Odette's cheek. She fixed her eyes on him with a languishing and solemn air which marks the women of the old Florentine paintings, in whose faint faces he had found the type of hers. He falls in love with her because, or falls in love, whatever you want to call it, because she looks like a Botticelli. There's nothing about her that he respects. Swimming at the brink of her fringed lids, her brilliant eyes, large and finely drawn as theirs, seemed on the verge of breaking from her face and rolling down her cheeks like two great tears. She bent her neck, as all their necks may have been seen to bend, in the pagan scenes as well as in the scriptural ones. And although her attitude was doubtless habitual and instinctive, one which she knew to be appropriate to such moments, she is a hooker after all, and was careful not to forget to assume she seemed to need all her strength to hold her face back, as though some invisible force were drawing it downwards toward, down towards Swan's. And here comes the moment. And Swan it was who, before he, she allowed her face, as though despite her efforts, to fall upon his lips, held it back for a moment longer, at a little distance from between his hands, he had intended to leave time for her mind to overtake her body's movements, to recognize the dream which she had so long cherished, and to assist at its realization. The pronouns are all wrong, by the way. This is Scott Moncrief, but who cares? It's beautiful, OK? Uh, so let me reread it for you. He had intended to leave time for his mind to overtake her body's movements, to recognize the dream which he had so long cherished and to assist at its realization. Like a mother, he never, Proust doesn't say mother, invited as a spectator when a prize is given to the child whom she has reared and loves. Perhaps moreover, there comes the other hand. Swan himself was fixing upon these features of an Odette not yet possessed, not even kissed by him, on whom he was looking now for the last time the comprehensive gaze with which, on the day of his departure, a traveler strives to bear away with him, in memory, the view of a country to which he may never return. They have sex that night. What happened to the sex? Nothing. In fact, what Proust will write later is the act of possession in which we possess nothing at all. In other words, there's what he's doing here, he's already, he wants his memory to come and join him. He has been looking forward to this moment, and now he wants the memory to join. And at the same time, he's taking away the memory of the first kiss, which will never be repeated again, because the first kiss always happens only once. Anyway, thank you. Yeah, I, th yeah, I think, I think he, the, <clears throat> the idea of possession and, and disillusion 
is essential is in Proust not just to love, but actually every single aspect of what Marcel goes through. And it, it's true, I think, I mean, it's true in, uh, in relation to his uh, navigation through the social world of Paris, for instance, where he aspires to rise up through the various salons, through the Madame Vergerin, to the Duke of Guermont, to the Prince of Guermont, and at each level, it manages to penetrate into another sort of sanctum of society, only to realize that the people he's meeting, these, these great names, these aristocrats, are actually banal and dull, and their conversation is fatuous, and that they're as snobbish and empty as everybody else. So it's a kind of, in a sense, the same kind of always experience in a way. He's always disillusioned. And if he's not disillusioned, if he actually is enamored, he will mess it up. He will bungle it. He's always bungling things. In other words, he goes through this wonderful lunch. Finally, he's made it inside the house. And you, he, you know, he's looking at the house from outside. This is where Gilbert Swann lives. Uh, I wish I could be inside. And then finally, he's invited. And so he's looking out their window at their guests and saying, my god, I'm in the present. I'm inside, looking outside. Yes, but one day I'm going to be outside again, looking back in, remembering myself. And and essentially, at, at the luncheon, at the luncheon that they have, there's an envelope with his name on it, and he takes it, and he's not going to read it now. He puts it in his pocket. Of course, he, he's messing it up because he's supposed to know what's written because it's the person he's supposed to accompany to the dining table. So, uh, he, he, of course, he doesn't escort that person at all. It's always a mess uh, in, in Marcel. And, but there's one moment I forgot to mention. There's a moment in which Albertine is finally in his bed. This is it, this is the moment. He's in his bed and she says, you know, we can play a bit further if you want. And he says, no, you know what? Let me take a rain check. Uh, <laughs> uh, it's called a bon, okay, in French. Let me take something like a rain check. Let's do it another time. In other words, once it's a sure thing, he's not interested in it. Uh, he... And what about um, art? and Proust's journey through art towards the sort of final destination of the novel. Uh, and again, a kind, a, the same kind of need to possess and understand and then disillusionment. That, do you want to talk briefly about that experience with Elster, with Cotard? Oh, with, oh well, yes, Elster especially. I mean, yeah. Elster is the character of Monet. I mean, we think it's Monet. I think it's pretty much Monet. And he is... He's enamored of Monet, and he loves Monet. And uh, at the same time, the, the, the man is a, is, a, is a bit of a fraud, uh, but he's enamored of the fact that this man can paint the land as if it's the sea, and the sea as if it's the land. And he loves the ambiguity of not being able to tell whether what he's looking at is actually the sea or the, the, the land underneath it. And he loves that. And then one, I'm sorry, the, the scene I remember best is when he goes to he wants to meet Albertine somewhere, so he doesn't want to go to Elstir's studio. But his grandmother says, you have to go to Elstir's studio. So he goes to the studio, and sure enough, there is Albertine. So here's his moment. And of course, he pretends not to see her. OK, so th that is it's so typical. But the, the experience of art, and um, he, I mean, the music, art, and, and theater are essential in his understanding of what his mission is going to be, or what his me the meaning of life is, actually. But then, you, when you think about it, what really brings meaning to his life is not just art, but the sound of a spoon that's sort of stirring a cup. And that little tintinabulation for him is almost a call to the mission or to the vocation of his life as an artist. And maybe we can speak about one thing that we have not mentioned. It's the question of his style. His style itself is a huge machine which seeks to, it's like a huge amoeba that you see in horror movies. That, so basically, it's going to engulf everything. And if it's too big for it, well, it's going to make itself more spacious so long as it can engulf every single detail, every nuance, every insight, every intercepted moment of emotion. It's going to log it all in, because it doesn't want to forget anything. It is, sorry to use the word, retention par excellence, OK? 
that's, that's all it wants to do, is just to retain, retain, retain. And among the things that it remembers best are the moments that it never possessed. But it also wants to reflect the way the mind, the consciousness works, endlessly looping back on itself and digressing just as it approaches key moments of thought. Pr the Proust's mind, consciousness will wander off on a three or four page digression, um, which is wonderful, wonderful and entertaining, but also characteristic of the way our strange minds work at moments of crisis or moments of great emotion. Well, I think that that's, in a sense, one of the reasons why he changes us is because when you read Proust, I always believe this, you're reading actually things that you already know. It is very hard to read Proust and say, oh, I never thought of that. Uh, <laughs> actually, it's all, you've thought of it a million times. You just never took the trouble to log it down and to see it in all its complexity. Um, it is actually quite amazing that someone took his time to write about the silliest things that happens between two human beings. I mean, the one scene that everybody remembers is a scene when Swan has discovered he's about to die. So he goes to visit his friend. Um, is it the Duc de Guermont? Yeah, the Duc de Guermont, and his wife is there, and they say, oh my God, don't worry about it, you're gonna get better, you're gonna get better. And they say, we have to leave right now because we're going to a soiree, and, um, but don't worry about it, you'll get better. And Swan, Swan says, yeah, sure, okay. And uh, they're in such a rush to leave, but then the president, the Duke, notices that his wife's shoes are the wrong color. He says, you gotta go upstairs and change again. So she'll take her time for that, they have time. But for the, the fact that their best friend is going to die, nah, we don't have time. But it's these observations, if you look at it, once you begin to look at your friends, this way, uh, yeah. then you basically are undressing everybody around you because you, you begin to understand that nobody's motives are honorable, nothing is decent about people, and at the same time there are moments of absolute beauty and kindness, but it never lasts. And one of the great paradoxes is that Marcel manages to get absolutely everything wrong. Um, I mean, you said not only he slips he slipped up yeah. and he fails at, to get what he wants to get, but also he manages, and you realize this by the end of the novel, he manages to have misunderstood ab absolutely every character in it. That's Saint Lou, his close friend, turns out to be homosexual. He didn't understand that. Madame Vergerin marries the Duc de Guermont. Everybody steps out of the role he'd already assigned them and becomes somebody else, yeah. being transformed. Oh, people change all the time. Uh, if, do we have any moment? Any we time? have, yes, we do. No. Yeah, we do. No, there's one incident that I think is so key. His grandmother, when they were at the beach together, she says, you know, I'm going to get myself photographed today. And she decks herself in the most beautiful way, exaggeratedly so. And he says, oh, God, she's a ridiculous old woman. Why doesn't she just stay herself? She's old. She's disgusting. Look, look at her. She's, she looks ridiculous. He finds out after she has died, and there's a photograph of her, that she knew she was dying, and she wanted to have him, to leave him a photograph of herself looking her very best. Now, it turns out that that's not the end of it, because you find that towards the end of the novel, and correct me if I'm wrong, um, he finds out that the reason why Saint Lou took her to get photographed that day had nothing to do with Marcel or with the grandmother. Saint Lou was having an assignation with somebody who was working for the photographer. Okay, and, and so you find, basically, that's why this is a novel that Proust, had he not died, would have gone on writing and writing and adding things, because, in essence, every character, when they're inviolate, turn out to be disgusting. When they're cruel and mean, they turn out to be decent and honorable. The character of Charlus, for example, is always morphing on us. We never know what to think of him. He's a huge sort of horrible human being, mean to Marcel, at the very end, he's a, he's a wonderful character. Now I'm being signaled, We'd, uh, we have only ten, ten, five, ten minutes left, so we wanted to open this up for questions from, from all of you. And I've also been asked to tell you that um, Andre and I will be available afterwards for private sessions <laughs> <laughs> on Proust in, in room 109, so you can have, you can have close encounters with us. <laughs> Yes, so. so um, I had a really hard time getting 
his novel published yes. to begin with, and I thought maybe you'd like to comment on that as a publisher yourself. Yes, well, s stepping back, one can understand how in, what was it, 1920, uh, or earlier than that, no, 14. 14, yes, it would have, receiving Proust's text as a publisher might have been an intimidating experience. And I think the famously, the first reader was uh, Andre, one of the first readers was Andre Gide, who was then editor-in-chief at Gallimard, and he famously rejected it and wrote a letter which has been preserved saying this is really unpublishable. But he, we don't even know if he read it. No, someone, <laughs> someone reported to him. Yeah. Um, and so Proust was turned down and then, of course, decided finally to publish, pay for it to be published himself by the firm of Grasset, which was then a done thing. Um, and then only later, I think after the publication of the second volume, which won the Prix Goncourt, did Proust's publishing life take off, but it took a long time. And, but I'm not surprised, Proust, there was nothing like Proust's novel. I mean, Andre's right, Proust was a 19th century writer and uses many of the tropes that he'd learned from Balzac and Hugo, but it was completely new and it was strange territory. And it's understandable that a publisher might be wait, afraid. Wait, would you publish Proust today had we never heard of him? I mean, it's unpublishable. As it, as it stands, yes. Who knows? I mean, it's <laughs> <coughs> I mean, had he just materialized? Uh, um, God, six volumes of this stuff? It's unreadable, they would say. It's a sentence that goes on for six pages I without know. stopping. Yes. Um, yeah. Yes. 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 Flowing style. But shorter flow. <laughs> Yeah. Yes. <clears throat> At the back, yeah. Could you talk a little about the way he wrote? For example, Joyce wrote on scraps of paper, which he kept in pockets all over his body and hidden under clocks and the backs of cabinets and everything, and then he assembled them all in all sorts of ways. Did this long, continuous flow of Proust's have anything to do with the fact he, that he liked to stay indoors a lot. Well, he had the time that way. Uh, yes. um, I think that, I mean, if you look at the, we, we have the, the, the galleys, for example, the galleys are the most, he wrote in a carnet that we do know, and he wrote in a carnet, and friends would give him presents of beautiful carnets, which many of them have been destroyed. Uh, or he wanted them to be destroyed. Some were notes, some were carnets. Um, and cahiers, actually. Um, but what, what is fascinating is when you look at the galleys of themselves, and they're all preserved at the Bibliothèque Nationale, is that you, have, I'll give you an example of one. Basically, he would have a sheet coming from the typesetter, and he would begin to scribble on it, because he was cutting, but he was also adding. But the way he added was so surgical, it was crazy. He would make, a, had his maid actually, make a little slit on the margins, and in that slit, he would add what would be the equivalent of a post-it note today. Uh, but the, and it would fold into the slit, so it would be held with glue, all right? Uh, but then, of course, the, 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 the post-it note, which I'm calling a post-it note, but it's not, would itself not be sufficient space. So he would have to make another slit in the post-it knot and add it. So you ha and of course it was hell for typesetters because essentially what they had to do was to reset the whole thing. All of it, it, it is, you would understand that, that costs money. Uh, uh, the, 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 and if you want a metaphor for that, think of the Talmud, which is a small text in the middle of a book and all around it you have this entire crazy apparatus, no, I'm not, being desecrations, okay. Uh, I'll take it back, it's not crazy, okay, it's brilliant. Uh, but the point is that you have this whole apparatus of what would be like an addition to the addition to the addition, and it never stopped. So, in fact, there are quarrels going on in France, have gone on in France for the past 20 years when they don't know what the actual final version of certain texts are because they were constantly being changed. And of course, as you're, and I think the same thing is true of Joyce. When he looked at a galley, he would sometimes forget what he had changed. So he would omit correcting something that was already corrected in the previous version. So it, it drives, and still today, we don't have a final edition of Ulysses. But that said, I, I mean, I think it's worth remembering that as a, as a total work of art, as a great work of literature, 
it is immaculately planned. Um, as a, there, are, there are moments and ideas, uh, motifs planted in an early novel that only develop seven volumes later, as if everything has been thought through in this most extraordinary architectural fashion almost. Brilliant. Yeah. In that way, I mean, you want to think of Bach, basically. What is started at the beginning will be picked up again and altered and picked up again. And finally, at the very end, you have this explosive moment when everything comes together, when he has three memories sort of melding together and telling him, come on, it's time to write this thing. Yes. That is, so ins that is so amazing, Odette and you know, Swan's daughter. And of course, Swan marries Odette when he no longer loves her. Oh yeah, in fact, yes, he stopped loving her. Uh, right, in fact, as soon as you read that sentence at the end of Swan in Love, when he says she was not even my type, my genre actually is the word, and he basically dismisses her altogether, the next sentence, it's a new section of the book, he's married to her. So why is he, and he continues to, he stops loving her, he's totally indifferent to whom she sleeps with, but he is still jealous the, of the person he, she used to be when he used to date her. And th this is the funny thing, that you, for those of you who have been jealous in your lives, and I hope some of you have, uh, you know that it's an emotion that you cannot control, and that even when you learn to hate the person and to forget them, sometimes you step back into the same jealousy as if it's still relevant, when it's no longer relevant at all. La Rochefoucauld, La, La Rochefoucauld said, so, sorry. I didn't. It's also wonderful about his secondary characters. Yes. Yes. Uh, Saint Loup is marvelous when he wants Marcel to meet his great love. And he wants, and he hides her, and he's not sure oh. how he's going to do it. And he finally invites him to lunch. And it turns out that he says she had been a whore <laughs> that Marcel knew. I mean, that is so crazy and so funny. He's got a marvelous oh. sense of humor. Oh, you have slapstick humor yes. in Marcel Proust. Yes. People forget that. And there's so many things. And also the maid. Oh, Francoise. She's great. <laughs> and she's carried through the whole. She's lived forever. Yes, in my, in my heart, she's, she's there. <laughs> And she protects him from <laughs> I mean, the characters are, are absolutely incredible. They're fantastic characters. Yeah, absolutely. Any other questions? I just want to go, oh, go back to you, or, um, what you said about not publishing him today, because you have authors like Nosgaard and Elena Ferrante who write five volume, you know, very fastidious looks at minutia. And it seems like Proust was, you know, is their father or grandfather or whatever. So I wanted to just ask you about his influence on contemporary literature. I, I think the influence of Proust has actually in a way burst out quite late. I mean, the idea, Knausgaard indeed, uh, has taken the idea of the first person narration, which goes into enormous minute detail across a life where nothing is too small or unimportant to be swept into the consciousness, and has, has, has reinvented it in, in, in a sense. But no, I think, I mean, Proust left an imprint on, on, on many, many artists in different ways, but the actual form of these books, which is unconventional, where you know, most readers expect a novel of a certain length with a beginning and a middle and an end, that has only actually really blossomed late, I think, in, that, in, that, in this interesting way. I think you're right. Mm -hmm. I'm totally right. I mean, there's an interesting um, c comparison, I think, with a novel that came out last year that some people in this room know all too well called A Little Life uh, by an author called Hanya Yanagihara, where, which was famously a very long book, very difficult, and had presented many problems for a publisher because, because of its length, because of its repetitiousness, because of its conscious sort of obsessiveness. And the publisher pushed back with the author aggressively and said, we can't publish it like this, but she insisted. So I think these arguments will continue, but there'll be nothing like Proust, I don't think, ever, quite in the same way. No, no, there won't be. Uh, or there might be somebody who's about to be born, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, well, thank you very much. Indeed, thank you.
I was thinking...